Okay? So, so that's where we land up. And now we make exactly the same argument as yesterday, which is to say, hang on, <coughs> epsilon j1, j2, up to jd of u j1, i1, u j2, i2, up to u jd, id. What is this thing equal to? Well, it's an anti-symmetric tensor. Yesterday, we swapped two indices, and we saw, for example, if we swap I1 and I2, this thing is anti-symmetric. So it will be proportional to um, epsilon I1, I2, up to ID. And using exactly the same argument as we did yesterday, we can argue that this coefficient of proportionality is just the determinant of U. So now what we learn is um, if we have both of these invariants, okay, for that to be invariant, we need to look at unitary matrices. For this to be invariant, we are forced to have determinant equal to 1. So we're going to impose both of those conditions and see what group we get. Okay? So let me maybe now just clean this. So this statement implies we are dealing with unitary <coughs> matrices. And this statement implies the determinant of our matrix is equal to 1. Now, yesterday we started with OD. And when we wanted to say that we were dealing with determinant matrices with determinant equal to 1, we appended an S. We said the S stood for special. And the subset that we were considering that was special, they were special because they had a determinant equal to 1. In exactly the same way, we started off with UD. We are again going to consider matrices with determinant equal to 1. So we again append an S. We are now talking about the group SUD. <coughs> okay. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do what we did for every single other example. We're going to ask ourselves, what do the generators look like? Now, we've just argued that if these are going to be unitary matrices, that implies that our generators are Hermitian. So we're going to have Hermitian generators. Um, so unitary implies Hermitian um, generators. Okay, that's fine. What does determinant u equal to 1 imply? What does det u equal to 1 imply? Now, I just want to remind you, okay, because this is going to be different to the analysis before. When we did OD and SOD, if you look back, they had the same generators. And in fact, we were able to argue that OD has got two disconnected components. And using the generators, we could only get hold of that component that was connected to the identity. So if I just gave you the generators, you wouldn't be able to tell if we were dealing with OD and SOD. So your natural guess at this stage might be, well, we're not going to get a condition on our generators. I mean, that's what we saw for OD and SOD. They had the same generators. Imposing that the determinant was equal to 1 had no... Um, implication at the level of the generators. Are we going to get some implication now? Well, let's see. Our generators are Hermitian. That means that I can diagonalize them. So my group element looks like um, E to the I alpha T. And let me imagine now I have diagonalized T. And I'm going to work on the basis in which T is diagonal. I can do that because when I calculate a determinant, it doesn't matter in which basis I calculate it. So I'm going to choose the easiest one, which is the basis in which t is diagonal. That's the basis I'm going to use. So let's denote t. It's got eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, all the way up to lambda d. And if you plug that matrix into that exponential form, you can easily check that we get e to the i alpha lambda 1, e to the i alpha lambda 2, all the way up to e to the i alpha lambda d. So to get here, I use that 
I use that. And the other thing that I use is, if I've got an exponential of a matrix, it's defined by its power series expansion. So I power series expand the exponential, and everywhere where I see a t, I plug that in. Then I look at the series that I'm generating, and I will notice that I'm actually generating these series. So I've summed them up now. And now I want to take the determinant. Okay, so let me be explicit. There are noughts off the diagonal. If I want to take the determinant of a diagonal matrix, what is that equal to? Product of diagonal elements, right? So let's take that product. The debt of e to the i alpha t will be equal to, well, it'll be e to the i alpha lambda 1 times e to the i alpha lambda 2 times. And then we're going to keep going until we get e to the i alpha lambda d. But if I've got e to the a times e to the b, that's e to the a plus b. So I can write this as e to the sum of all of those guys. So this is e to the i alpha times by the sum from i is equal to 1 to d of lambda i. But that sum from i is equal to 1 to d is just the trace of t. So this is just e to the i alpha trace of t. And I've said that I want to consider those set of matrices which have determinant of u equal to 1. So I want to set this equal to 1. Well, e to the naught is equal to 1. So my condition now that I get is what this implies. This implies the generators are traceless. Okay? So we've learned that we have to impose an extra condition. To get the generators of UD, we only have to take Hermitian matrices. To get the generators of SOD, we have to take Hermitian and traceless. How was that going to affect our previous counting of the generators? Well, is that traceless? Sure, that's traceless. There's just noughts down the diagonal. Is that traceless? Yes, that's traceless. There's just noughts down the diagonal. Is that traceless? Nope. So I'm going to have to modify these. How will I modify them? Well, it turns out I can no longer construct d independent generators. I can only construct d minus 1 independent generators. Um, and those you could take, if you wanted to, you could take those d minus 1 independent generators to have the following form. I could put a 1 in the first position, and then I could start filling diagonal elements with noughts. Then I can put 1 minus 1, and I can keep filling with noughts. If I do that, clearly the trace is 0 because 1 minus 1 is naught. So how many choices do I have? Well, I stick a 1 into the first position, and then I must stick a minus 1 into one of the remaining positions. How many remaining positions are there? D minus 1. So in actual fact, this is pretty interesting. We've had an extra condition imposed. And in fact, this extra condition for the case of the unitary group has played a role even at the level of the Lie algebra. So the dimension of UD is D squared. The dimension of SUD is D squared minus 1. Okay? So I'll just summarize that. Dimension of UD. So, so what do we mean with the dimension of UD? This is how many labels we need to specify the transformation. This is also equal to the number of generators that we have in our Lie algebra. This is equal to d squared. And the dimension of SUD is equal to d squared minus 1. OK, good. Now, in actual fact, we can make a tiny connection to physics. And the reason for that is let's look at these invariants. <coughs> well, if you look at this invariant, what does invariant number 1 look like? It looks like a sum from i is equal to 1 to 3 of, now I'm going to write it as a psi i, a psi i star. This is how we build mesons in nature. We combine quarks with antiquarks. And we know 
from um, color symmetry in QCD, we know that, in fact, we have confinement, so we have to always build colorless states. So we must build states that are invariant under color transformations. Well, this looks like a meson. How many quarks are there in a baryon? Three. So the second invariant that we would have would be epsilon i, j, k, and now we bind together three quarks, and we can do it in this anti-symmetric way. So if these are the invariants, what group are we talking about? SU3. So, so remember I said we wanted to turn this question on its head, and sometimes it would be useful. Here's a case where it's useful. If somebody came into your office and they said, we've been able to do high energy experiments on a proton, and we found out that there are seven quarks in a proton, what group would they be dealing with? SU7, right? Because you'd have to have another invariant of that type. And um, so, so just by asking people to go off and do experiments and see how many states are there bound in this thing, plus the very strong requirement that you're going to get a state that's invariant under the symmetry, that's enough to tell you a lot about the dynamics. Okay. So, so now you know what ODR and SOD and UD and SUD. Now I want to do something which I, I hope won't be too boring. It's maybe now a little bit more technical, but at some point we have to do some of this stuff. And I'm going to prove two lemmas with you. I would say that these lemmas are maybe the most important lemmas that you could learn in group theory. Just about all of the results that you're going to use subsequently follow directly from these lemmas. One very interesting recent application of group theory has been to finding fuzzy spaces in string theory. So, so the idea is that perhaps string theory modifies the way that we look at the geometry of space-time. And the most powerful tool that has been applied to get hold of these spaces are precisely the lemmas that I'm going to show you now. So they go under the name of Schur's lemmas, and everything just about in group theory follows from these lemmas. Okay, so let's write down the first lemma. And I'll be careful to word it nicely. Um, so, the first sure lemma. <clears throat> Says the following Any matrix. which commutes with all of the matrices in an... What do you think that IRIP stands for? Irreducible representation. Okay, I'm just going to write irrep. When you read papers, you'll see people using that word. They mean irreducible representation. So any matrix, which, so, so maybe I'll just put that translation down. So irrep equals irreducible representation. So what does irreducible mean again? Ah, we can't block diagonalize it, right? So we're talking about guys that we can't block diagonalize. Any matrix which commutes with all of the matrices in an irreducible representation must be a multiple um, of the identity matrix. So what do we mean? Well, so if it what gamma is an irrep, and we also know B gamma of T is equal to gamma of T B, then in fact, and, and we know that this is true for all elements of the group then this would mean 